What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the channel, The Jewish Catholic. Like the new name? I do too. For today's video, we're going to be talking about something that I've been asked about before and you probably are wondering about it yourself right now. But before we go ahead and dig into the video, if you're not yet part of the family, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Because in this channel, we talk all things Torah, Halakha, Jewish thought, and more. Of course, if you end up enjoying this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up because it really does help the video and the channel. And if you find that the video is share worthy, make sure you share it with your friends and family. All right, let's go. All right, folks, the topic of the day revolves around the books known as the Deuterocanonical books. In Protestant circles, however, this is known as the Apocryphal books. Many people outside of the Catholic Church believe that the Catholic Church took it upon itself to add seven extra books to the canon of their Bible. This is actually incorrect. It's the other way around. Rather, it was the Protestant movement for different reasons that they ended up removing these seven books that I'll list right over here from the canon of the Bible. And I say the reasons vary because it wasn't a once done movement. It was sort of a slow process that ended up to the removal of these deuterocanonical books. One of these first changes actually is attributed to Martin Luther. In the year 1534, he decided to take these books in question, the apocryphal books, the deuterocanonical books, and put them in their own section. Although not removing them completely from the Bible, but he did make this distinction in which he treated them like a second class within the books. But the major changes started to happen around the times of the Puritan Revolution and around the British Civil Wars in the 1600s, mid 1600s, in which these books were completely banned from Protestant Bibles. This means that even some Protestant Bibles continue to have these books even after Martin Luther had made his distinction. An example of this is the 1611 version of the King James Bible. This is one of the most well-known Protestant translations out there. It's one that I even enjoy myself. And I have this version as well, the one that has the apocryphal books. However, if you look at Protestant Bibles now, and if you look at the modern rendition of the King James Bible, you will notice that the apocryphal books are no longer there. So why is this? Why is it that these books were removed by the Protestant church. You will hear many reasons, some of them being the fact that these books have contradictions compared to the other things that we see in scripture. Other reasons are actually attributed to the language being used. We know that the major languages of the Old Testament are Aramaic and Hebrew. However, if we look at these books in specific, the ones in question, you will notice that they are not all actually written in Hebrew. Some of them still have parts in Aramaic, but a lot of them are in Greek. And this might seem a little bit suspicious to these writers, at least with the scholarship that was available at that time. Of course, now this takes us to another source to prove that this is actually a wrong move by the Protestant movement. And this comes along when we look at different canons, if you will, that were used in the time of Yeshua. For example, if we look at the writings known as the Septuagint, which is actually a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it did contain these books, the Deuterocanonical books. Now, what is the Septuagint? As legend goes, this manuscript was actually attributed to 70 Jewish rabbis, where 70 Jewish scribes were put in separate rooms and they were charged with the translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic texts into Greek. The reason for this was that Greek was the major language at this point in time. It was the common tongue, almost like what English is today. So to make the scriptures accessible to more people, it was translated. Now, the miracle behind all of this is that, according to the legend, that all of these rabbis, when they came out of their chambers and they showed and displayed and shared amongst each other what they had translated, all of the 70 copies were exactly the same. Now, whether this is 100% true or not, we don't really know. 
but what we do know is that this translation was widely used and accepted throughout the Jewish world. As a matter of fact, if we look at a lot of the writings that we see in the New Testament, when the apostles or Yeshua quote the Old Testament, it seems to be that the translation or the scriptures that they're using actually derive from the Greek Septuagint. Now, although we do have the translation of the Septuagint, there was no set canon yet. This was still a debate amongst Jews. Some people do think that the debate was settled and that the canon, the Jewish canon, was decided upon even before the time of Yeshua. Unfortunately, this is not true. As we can see throughout history, the canonization of the Hebrew scriptures actually took a long time, and it can go as far back as 200 BC and 200 AD. Some Protestant scholars suggest that the canon used by the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, was fully authorized in the Council of Jamnia or Yavna. The only problem with this is that that council never really happened. This actually comes from a lot of obscure sources and very soon I'm going to give you some sources to show that this was not the case. The canon was not decided in this so-called Council of Javna. Now this is a critical point because many Protestant scholars use this as evidence and support for their rendition of the canon. But if it's not true, then that cookie starts to crumble quite quick. So what evidences do we have to prove that this council never happened and that the discussion of the canon was still ongoing. First of all, this council of Yavna was supposed to be happening around the first century. However, we see in Mishnaic writings that even at that point, the canon of the Jewish scriptures was still being debated. Take for example what we find in the Mishnah, in the section known as Yadaim 3.5, where we find a debate, a discussion in regards to the book of Songs of Songs, aka Canticles of Canticles, where it was still being debated whether these books rendered the hands unclean. Now this term, rendering the hands unclean, is a rabbinic term that signifies that if a book is actually holy and it's actually actually scriptural. It has the ability to be so holy that it'll show your impurities and therefore rendering your hands unclean. So in other words, if it does render your hands unclean, then it's good. If it doesn't, it's a no-go. Not only do we find this argument in the Mishnah, but if we go even further in time, in the rest of the books in the Talmud, we will find this. In the Talmud Bavli, Tractate Chagiga, we find that in section 13a, we are again finding a discussion regarding the validity of certain books and whether they were trustworthy and useful as scripture or just extra Jewish writings. So as we can see through these ancient Jewish writings, we can see that the debate continued. And it wasn't until much later on that the Hebrew scriptures were officially canonized. And this was actually done after Christians had what they considered the scriptures. Although it hadn't been officially set, pretty much every book that you find right now in the Catholic scriptures is exactly what they were using around that time. Now we do find something interesting when we look at the writings of Jerome, where he preferred sticking to the Hebrew scriptures and thus he placed the deuterocanonical books in a lesser light. It doesn't mean that he scrapped them and he didn't consider them scripture. He just had a larger sense of approval for the Hebrew books. But then around this time, we also find that St. Augustine was looking at it from a different angle. And his apologia for this was the fact that the books were actually in the Septuagint. So to him, that made them legit. And like I mentioned, these books had been used by Christians for a long time. But then later on, as we spoke about before, in comes Martin Luther and he starts playing around with the canon. He makes a distinction of the deuterocanonical books, calls them apocryphal, puts them in a separate section. Then come the Puritans and other people and start changing it completely and they remove these books from the Protestant scriptures. So the question becomes, who is the authority? Who has the ability to decide what books are or are not in the Bible, what should or should not be considered scripture. This is a very important topic of discussion because this is another one of those big points that separate the Protestant from the Catholic Church. It's all about authority. Within the Protestant movement, we find the concept of sola scriptura, 
which basically means that the Bible alone is the sole infallible source of authority for a Christian. But then if that's the case, where do you get this table of contents that helps you decide what books are and are not canonical? Which ones are actually scripture? Because how can you determine that a book is scripture, but the scriptures themselves don't tell you that it is scripture, so you're kind of tying yourself up in a knot. However, when we go to the Catholic Church, we don't believe simply in sola scriptura, but we also have sacred tradition. And on top of that, we also have the magisterium, which is the living authority of the church. And this is not just men deciding whatever they want on their own, but rather this is the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God that fills the leadership of the church to allow them to be able to make decisions such as this one. So after Martin Luther had made his claim that these books were not as important, in the year 1546, the Catholic Church comes in and combats this by showing its authority given through Christ. And the Church declares with authority that the deuterocanonical books are just as scriptural as the protocanonical books. So in the matter of authority, one can claim that the Protestants were also being guided by the Spirit. But here's the rub, that the Protestant movement doesn't claim that its authorities are infallible, rather that the scripture alone is infallible, and thus leaving a gap right open to say that perhaps their decision was incorrect. And in fact it is, because the only authority to be able to create this canon is given through the Messiah to the Catholic Church by the bishops through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So that was the history, but what about the books themselves? To be honest with you, I find that these books are amazing. They contain a lot of wisdom, a lot of history, and a lot of important facts. For example, for me, being that I'm Jewish and I love celebrating Hanukkah, the real source for that history is not found anywhere else except for in the book of Maccabees. This also helps us to gap the time between the prophets and the time in which Yeshua comes in gives us all this history that makes the solid continuation all the way from the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, and the Brit Hadasha, the New Testament. Now, I hope that these sources were useful to you. I know that there's probably more questions out there, so that's what the comment section is for. So make sure you leave your comments down in the comment section below. As for me, I'm glad that I finally accepted the fact that the Deuterocanonical books are indeed scripture because it just makes more sense through history, through what we see, the richness. It's a beautiful thing. But sadly, if you're missing these seven books, I think it's time for you to get a new Bible. But that's just me. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Make sure you give it a thumbs up if you did. Have a blessed week. Shalom.